So if you meet this checklist, in the world's eyes, you're the dude, you know, that guy's the man, he drives a dance, you know. You meet this checklist, all right, he's a man, he's got it all. With that said, who does the world say that we are? All right, so here's its idea, here's what a man looks like. Who are you? You're a football player. You're a basketball player. You're a smart kid. That's who you are. You know, it's something you do, but that's who you are. Unfortunately, a lot of times, it's your failure. That's who you are. You screwed up. You're a screw-up. That's who you are. You're not good enough. The world definitely tells us we're not good enough and we don't meet up with these standards that the world has set for us. This is what it's like to be a man. This, these were needs to be met. If you don't meet these, you're not a man. So the world takes these things that we do and tries to tell us that that is who we are. You're your basketball player. You're a failure. And unfortunately, so many guys look to these things to try to find their identity and spend their whole lives chasing these things to find out who they are. I don't want this man, that's who I am. I don't want after, that's who I am. That all the mistakes that you've made make up who you are. The world will tell you that you're not good enough. If you don't meet these standards that we set for you, you're not good enough. As I stand right here, before you guys, I can look all of you in the eyes and tell you that everything the world says to you about masculinity, what it means to be a man, is an absolute lie. The world is lying to you. When I was your guys' age, I bought into all these lies. Every single one of them. I was Chaz, I was popular, I was a basketball player, girls liked me, that's who I was, and so I tried so hard to keep up that identity. All right, I have to keep being a star basketball player. I have to keep making sure the girls like me. That's who I was. And I tried so hard to impress. I tried so hard to appear on the outside that I had everything together, that I knew who I was. And to keep up with that identity that the world had set for me. And so if you looked at me on the surface level, everything was good. Happy go like you do, whatever. Have things going for him, girls liked him. And on the surface, I appeared fine. But at the same time, while I had all these things going for me, what I'm sure most of you have going for you as well, on the inside, something was eating me up. That identity wasn't who I was and wasn't satisfying. Me and my buddies struggled with things. We did things we shouldn't do. We looked at things on the internet we shouldn't. We treated girls like they were objects for our pleasure to see for our entertainment. And over the years, that was just eating away at me on the inside. Like I said, outside, okay. Inside, felt like garbage. Felt like absolute garbage. And I felt dead. Over those years when I was in organization, I was slowly digging my grave and slowly entering into it. When I entered into high school, I went on a retreat, and for the first time, through the Eucharistic Adoration, I met Jesus. You know, I had gone to Catholic grade school my whole life. I knew who Jesus was, right? We hear about him all the time. But it was that retreat that I actually met Jesus. I knew who he was. And for the first time in my life, I let God tell me who I was, as opposed to what the world told me who I was. You know, you're an athlete, you're this, you're that. But for the first time, I let God look at me and tell me who I was. How many of you guys have seen The Lion King? All right, I'm not ashamed about The Lion King. I remember when I was a kid. And The Lion King, there's a part where Simba, who's Mufasa's son, and Mufasa is killed, who's the king of the kingdom, Simba gets scared and runs off and hangs out with the, what, a pig and a, what's that thing called? It's Moon and Pumba, right? He's not hanging out with all the lions. Meerkat, thank you. Meerkat. And so he's running around living this life that he's not supposed to live. 
And Rafiki, the monkey, brings him to the water one night, and in the water he sees his dad. He sees Mufasa. And I'll give my best Mufasa impression. He looks in the water and sees Mufasa, and Mufasa says, You have forgotten who you are. You are my son. And for the first time in my life, I let God look at me and say that to me. That I was his son. And just like how Simba was an heir to the throne, so are we. That we are God's son, that we are heirs to the throne. And for those years when I struggled with that interior struggle, I had started believing this lie that I was made up of all these mistakes that I made. That all these things that made me feel dirty and shameful, stuff that I was trying to hide from my parents, from God, I thought that's who I was. And that I couldn't get away from those things. There's a great quote by Blessed J.P. too, and he says, You're not the sum of your weaknesses and failures. You're the sum of the Father's love for you. You're not the sum of your weaknesses and failures, but the sum of the Father's love for you. So all your shortcomings, all your failures, doesn't make up who you are. You're still God's son. That is who you are. And for the first time, I like God telling them. And it was that, at that same time that God told me, this life you're living, that's not what I have planned for you. That's not what I want for you. I want something so much better for you. My plans are so much better than your own. I have a life of greatness planned for you. And he gave me an invitation to that life of greatness. He said, that life you had before, you know how you feel. You know what to do to have that life. You keep doing that. But I invite you into this life of greatness, this life that I have planned for you. And the plans that I have for you are great. And so I decided that night, <laughs> that I wanted God's plans for my life instead of my own. The ones that had been bogging me down, weighing me down, made me feel like I was dead, hiding to a life in Christ where he told me he's going to make everything new. And that he had great plans. And he invited me to leave that baggage. And we're so fortunate that we are able to leave our baggage. And that my passageway from death to life came to the confessional. That Christ invited me into the confessional and said, leave this with me. I want this. I'll take it from you. And I'll give you this. And so I found a new life in Christ. And my life from that point before Christ, afterwards, literally a million times better. A million times better. And I'm sure some of you can relate where you feel like you're in this hiding. You're trying to hide yourself from your parents from God. And you want something more. Well, Christ invites us into that something more. He invites us into a life of greatness. Pope Mary's Benedict XVI said, The world offers you comfort. All right, think of all the things we like. Video games, movies, food, all these things that we like, all these things that make up the world's masculinity. They don't make us comfortable. We're comfortable. You can live a comfortable life by having lots of stuff. Stuff makes you comfortable. But Pope Emeritus Benedict said, the world offers you comfort, but you're not made for comfort, you're made for greatness. That the comforts of this world, not worth it. Not what you're called to. We are called to greatness. You're called to greatness. How many of you guys have seen the movie Braveheart? Braveheart. Alright, for those of you who don't know, Braveheart's about the Scots fighting for the freedom from England. And there's one man named William Wallace. Named William Wallace, who literally just takes over. Right? And he inspires so many men to fight behind him, to fight for their freedom. And for those of you who have seen this movie, you can see that he lives a life of greatness because he lives a life for others. And I'm sure you guys can think of other movies where the main character lives a life for others, and you're drawn to that, where it's like, yeah, I want to be like that guy. Like, he's freaking awesome. I'm sure you guys have thought that. And we all have that natural desire for that greatness, to live life for others. And that's what masculinity looks like. 
a life lived for others. Not about me, 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 but a life for others. Another great example of that is Blessed Pierre Giorgio Frassati. He was a young Italian stud, died in the early 1900s. Came from a wealthy family, and his morning, all the money that he had, he would go and spend time with the poorest of the poor around his hometown. And when he loved climbing mountains, just a man's man, a stud. Had everything going for him, but he didn't want the comforts of this world. He knew he was called a great city. He spent time with these poor people. And when he was 24, he contracted polio and was spending time with these poor people and he was dying. And on his deathbed, last thing he wrote, he wrote a note for a man's prescription to be filled. At his funeral, there were thousands of people there. And his parents just had his funeral at their regular church. And there's thousands of people coming and they're like, who the heck are you? Like, what are you doing here? And they found out the life that he lived that they never knew about. Their own son, they didn't know that he was living this life of greatness, this life for others. That's what masculinity looks like. Another great example, Father Capron. He was a military chaplain in World War II. He just received the uh, what's the National or Congressional Medal of Honor, the highest honor in the military. All right, and there are stories about him being in the bullet zone and him grabbing men by the shoulders and literally chucking them to safety. A handful of accounts of him doing so. He lived a life of grace, he lived a life for others. He ended up dying as a prisoner of war. He lived a life for others. And when we hear these stories, like I said, you guys can all think of these movies where these guys live his life for others. And it's awesome, and you're drawn to it because each and every one of you is called to a life of greatness. And a life of greatness isn't about me, me, me. That's not it. That's not what masculinity is. A life of greatness is a life lived for others. And the ultimate example that we can see for masculinity, what masculinity looks like, is in Jesus. Oftentimes people see Jesus and think of him as some mammy pammy Mr. Rogers, nice, peace, hippie guy. And that wasn't who he was. That's not who he was. He was a man's man. He was manly. He carried his cross after nearly being beaten to death. This is what masculinity looks like. He held nothing back on this cross. He gave everything. He lived his life for others. And that's what masculinity looks like. A life for others. A life of greatness. And Christ gives us the perfect example of what it is to be a man. A sacrificial life lived for others. We're all called to that greatness. One of the biggest problems I think in the world today is that there are too many boys and not enough men. There are too many boys and not enough men. And you can see it in our culture. The way girls are treated, the names girls are called. And if it's not us who's standing up for what's true, if it's not us standing up and being men, who's going to do it? If it's not us, it's not you, then who? Nobody is. It's on us to be men. Blessed J.P. 2 also has one of my other favorite quotes. He says, God has assigned as a duty to every man the dignity of every woman. God has assigned as a duty to every man the dignity of every woman. So it's our duty to be men, to fight for what is true, to protect our sisters, to protect our brothers. That's what greatness looks like. A life lived for others. So as I said, our identity is not found in the things of this world. That's not who we are. We are not made up of our failures and our weaknesses. We are made up of the Father's love for us. All right, and contrary to popular belief, being a man in today's world, a Christian man, is the absolute hardest thing you can do. But it's the most manly thing. Because the world, the world doesn't want that for you. It doesn't. A life with 
Jesus is an adventure, it's a challenge. How many of you guys like challenges in you? We like challenges as men. The greatest challenge we ever received is to live a life like this. It's not boring. Think about what God has done. Look at creation. Look at everything. It's exciting. It's awesome. The man who stared Pontius Pilate in the face without flinching. The man who carried this cross. The man who threw the tables over in the temple. The God who split the Red Sea. Think about that. That's an adventure. That's what we're called to a life of greatness. A life of greatness. So remember that. Your identity is not found in these things in this world. You're not just a football player. You're not just a basketball player. You're not a failure. You're not the sum of your weaknesses and failures. You're God's son and heir to the throne. And you're called to a life of greatness. Not of comfort. Of greatness. Don't be afraid of it. Don't be afraid of a life for others. It's when we lose ourselves to others that we find ourselves. One of my favorite, favorite phrases in Latin is esto vir. One of my favorite saints, St. Jose Maria Scrivener, would always say this, esto vir. And esto vir in Latin means be a man. And so I leave that challenge with you guys in here to are up for challenges. Esto vir. Be a man. Live a life of greatness. You're all called to it. You all can do it. Don't be afraid of it. That's still weird. Right now, I'd like to introduce Stephen Kelly. Stephen Penny. I guess I'd like to tell sometimes. He's going to come up and talk about Facebook.